seen a few ideas and tips, which we're not going to be talking about this morning, but this video I thought summed up a lot of that very well. Let's go now back to the Word, and let's unpack what this passage actually says. So Paul first tells us to rejoice always. In fact, in Philippians 4, 4, uh, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I mean, what was he expecting? <laughs> really? Come on, Paul. I mean, this is a pretty high expectation. Like, who really lives that way? Who really does? Well, guess what? There are people who, who do. They are called spirit-filled people, people who rely on the Holy Spirit, and people who put in the sweat equity to understand that and submit themselves to Jesus Christ. But before we go into understanding what this really means, we've got to be clear about what it doesn't mean. I think that's important to know that as well. Paul's not telling us that we've got to be happy, happy all the time, right? I mean, that would be foolish. Imagine somebody skipping around, you know, on a war zone, giggling with glee, telling everybody to meet how happy, happy he is, right? Handing out little Hershey's kisses and little flowers. I mean, we, we'd think the guy was crazy. We'd think he's nuts. I mean, so granted, at the same time, it's no fun to be around somebody who's, who's in the dumps all the time, but it's also kind of annoying to be around somebody who's happy, happy, right? And terpy all the time. Somebody who, who, who's like a Pollyanna, whoever refuses to acknowledge that the glass is half empty and looking at reality. Ever been around some of those people? They drive you crazy. I mean, they're, they're just not realistic about things. Do you remember Tigger? You know who Tigger is? Tigger from Winnie the Pooh? And, and he's always ready for a party, and he's always ready for a good hug, <laughs> right? And uh, I have kids, so I kind of practice that. But he's always seeing the upside of life, driving everyone around him crazy. Eeyore, on the other hand, what's Eeyore like? Well, you know, sad the world's going to end. You know, he's, he's always sad about the facts of life, and he sighs much about it. When Debbie, I'm just thinking of, of my relationship with Debbie. Debbie and I, when we first got married, we've been married now 29 years. When we first got married, we had to figure each other out. And uh, our habits, our idiosyncrasies, all those different things about us, particularly those habits which relate to early mornings. <laughs> and uh, you see, I'm the type of guy who just loves mornings. You know, I'll, I'll roll out of bed humming a happy tune and uh, grabbing my coffee. I'm raring to go. And at the same time, I don't talk a lot at night because I'm starting to crash by then. But, but watch out when it's morning. I got all kinds of things I want to share with you <laughs> and sing to you. And uh, Debbie, on the other hand, not so much. <laughs> talk to her about that. Now... She did not appreciate, I, I couldn't believe it, she did not appreciate my morning joy as much as I thought she should. But, um, now I'm not suggesting Debbie's an Eeyore, but I got to tell you, I certainly am a Tigger. And uh, <laughs> luckily for the rest of you people, the, the world uh, seems to have a lot less Tiggers than, uh, than there are Eeyores, and so <laughs> I get that. But let's face it, we all know there are times in reality that the world and the circumstances bring us unhappiness that do not bring us loads of joy. Circumstances bring us sadness, grief. We can think about some of those things right now. Probably every one of us have those times when you think back and go, yeah, maybe even right now. Yes, I'm in one of those places right now. Maybe even a sense of bewilderment. So Paul isn't telling us, oh, just put on a happy face. That's not what he's saying. God doesn't want us to be phony. He doesn't want us to put on these masks. In fact, we're supposed to be taking off these masks. Jesus hates hypocrites. And when we try to be phony and try to have this happy, happy look all the time, that's being fake. That's being a hypocrite. And Jesus hates that. He wants us to be real. He wants us to understand. That's why we talk a lot about the fact that we're messy. We remind ourselves about that because, let's face it, we are. We have those issues and those challenges and those depressions and those bad days and those bad weeks and those bad months and those bad years. We do. He wants us to be real. And being real sometimes means that we just don't feel happy. So Paul uses a very specific word here. He uses the word rejoice. What does he mean by that? Paul uses this word rejoice in this text really as another way to say joy. I don't know if you understand really what this word means. It actually means, if you see the word rejoice, really means re-joy. It's a, it's a word that implies an ongoing action. It literally means to replay in your heart the joy that you first experienced when you met Jesus for the very first time. Do you remember that day? Do you remember the joy that you had when Jesus met you and he changed your life? 
He transformed you from who you were into who you are and knowing that he's going to be changing you and who you're going to become. Do you remember that? He has been changing you into the person that you were actually created to be, giving you that identity that you had been missing all your life. Remember that day and the joy that you had when that happened? And so Paul's saying, rejoy. Think about that. Redo it. Paul uses that word on purpose, and he doesn't use the word happiness for a reason, interestingly enough. It's because the word happiness is not the idea Paul was going after. He, the sense of the word joy is much deeper than the meaning behind happiness. Happiness is tied into the circumstances that, and the feelings where we find ourselves, whereas joy is unrelated to the circumstances around us. And really, instead, it's anchored to a solid relationship with God. So the deeper our roots extend into this relationship with Jesus Christ, the more joy we'll know in spite of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's a mystery. It, 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 it doesn't make sense to the natural mind. But this is what happens in the supernatural world that Jesus ushers us into. It's amazing stuff. The, more the, uh, the, the meaning then is if you don't have a true and vital relationship with God, you can't know this kind of joy. You can only know it if you have a relationship with God. In other words, if you're still putting your confidence in your own abilities, if you think that you can do it on your own, if faith is more of an academic activity and exercise than a vital relationship, a heart relationship in your life, you'll never know that kind of joy. Trust me. You just won't. I read this excellent book, by the way, by a guy by the name of Ed Erwin Lutzer. I don't know if you've read any of his writings. And he was talking about what happens after we die in this particular book. It's called Your Eternal Reward. In the book, Lutzer tells of a time that he was bobbing up and down in a boat. He was on Lake Michigan. It was just outside of Chicago. And he's up and down on this boat, and he starts to get seasick. And uh, his friend tells him, okay, listen, Erwin, pick a building there on the shore and focus on that building. So this is what Lutzer wrote. He says, I chose the Sears Tower and discovered in a few moments that I felt better. He, his friend, explained that the motion of a boat confuses our balance system if we look at the very object that is causing our movement. In other words, the boat rocking up and down or the waves rocking. But we can handle the ups and downs if our eyes have fixed, have a fixed object that is unmoved by our own vacillation or by our own moving and bobbing. That's how we experience joy, people. You can't focus on the circumstances of life. Ever tried to do that? Ever been in a place where you're just so filled with angst and anxiety about because everything, uh, it seems like a whirlwind around you or like a merry-go-round that just won't stop and it seems to be going faster and faster and faster and you feel like you're going to fly off at any moment and you're hanging on for dear life. Ever been there before? I have. I hate those moments. They're not fun. You can't, you, 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 here's the thing, you can't focus on the circumstances of life, otherwise they make you sick. We'll, I mean, certainly you're going to be joyful at times. Yeah, you're going to have those moments of happiness, certainly, but... What happens is they end, and, and you find that your joy is lacking, and, and it's like a repetitive circle. Well, I didn't get it there. I guess it ended, so I've got to find it somewhere else. Or I've got to try it again and find that same experience there in that place. Instead, what we need to be doing is putting our focus on something that's constant. And that constant we have as disciples of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, is God the Father. In fact, we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus, Jesus who is God, and keep them there. So we look at the character. We look at the promises of God, and they're abundant to us. So really, ultimately, to take away the seasickness of life, what do we do? We focus on things like God's righteous character, on, on Christ's redemptive work in our life, on the spiritual blessings that we have, the promise of future glory, uh, of answered prayer, the gift of God's word, of uh, authentic relationships in the body of Jesus Christ. The privilege of being able to share the life-changing message of the gospel like you did the other night, Russell. Now, do you notice something about these things that, uh, that I just mentioned? Here, here's what I noticed anyways about them. They're generally not the things that we think of as the key to our joy. Not normally anyways, not naturally. I mean, most of us would list things like good health, Family, job satisfaction, great experiences, personal achievements. But what happens when something happens? 
See, God doesn't change. Uh, everything else does. Everything else ends. Everything else can go sideways in a moment. Our focus then often, if we do that, is on the storm toss, the, the circumstances that are mixed up and bobbing up and down rather than the stable character of God. And, and so often we miss out on joy because we're trying to create it for ourselves and we're trying to hang on. When we try to produce joy, we're actually working against joy. You've got to know that. Here's why. Because when you look to your activities and to your devices to bring you joy, we're not looking at Jesus then. See? See how that ties together? How that works? When we're relying on external things, we're distracted from the internal working of God's Spirit in our heart. The harder we work to find the joy, the further we drift from the Lord and that joy we're looking for. Now you can test me on that, by the way. I wouldn't suggest you do that, but you can test me on it. Some of us have tested that. I tested that for years before I found Jesus. Finally, when I found Jesus, my life changed. My life stopped being that merry-go-round that was just spinning faster and faster and faster. And I finally found an answer in Jesus, and I fixed my eyes on him. And he stabilized my life, and he brought me purpose, and he brought me um, uh, a, a definiteness of purpose that I could follow. What happens is, is often, though, when we're trying to do it ourselves, it's like we're, we're like a person who's drowning. And maybe you've seen that. Maybe some of you have taken um, lifeguard courses and what are some of the things that they try to tell you to do? They calm down the person who's drowning because often the person who's drowning will flail around all over the place and they're, and they're splashing the water and they're boop, you know, knocking you in the head as a lifeguard and you're trying to calm them down. Why are they doing that? Because they're doing everything they can to try to save themselves instead of relying on somebody else to come and save them. They're trying to do it on their own. And the more they do that, the more they try to save themselves, the more they try to do things on their own, the more difficult it is for them to be saved. We've got to quit doing that ourselves, church. Same thing with joy. Our instinct is to try to do things to produce joy. You can't produce joy, and now I know this is going to sound, sound uh, uh, opposite of what we've been telling you, but you can't do joy according to our worship music. It's not going to bring us joy. Yeah, we can get joy, but that's not going to be our basis for joy. We can't produce it through our missions, through our music, through our methods, methods, through our meditation. You can't do it through our message. You can't do it through anything else. You can only do it through Jesus Christ. And the harder we try to create joy, the more elusive it becomes. Joy comes from resting in Jesus, not running. Joy comes in trusting in God, not in working. So learn to rest in God's work in your life. Trust Him to do the amazing in you and through you. I mean, remember God's faithfulness in the past. And when you're in those moments where it seems like God isn't there, well, ask yourself this question. Has God been faithful in the past? Yes. Will He be faithful in the future? He promises to be, and I believe He will, because God is a good God, so that means He's good. We sung about that, by the way. God is a righteous God, so it means He's right. So then I can trust Him into the future. So what's changed? The only thing that's changed is me. It's my attitude. So I've got to get my eyes back onto Jesus, back onto God and trust Him. Remember how He loved you, how He still loves you, how He saved you, how He's still saving you. This is the gospel message and how He's going to continue to save you in eternity. That's an amazing gospel message, church. Remember the joy you had at your first meeting with Jesus, how He changed your life. So rejoice in that thought. Rejoice always in that place. The second command He gives us is to pray continually. Okay, another interesting command, don't you think? I, there's a lot of people who d dismiss this command as kind of ridiculous hyperbole or exaggeration or a little kind of hokey or really that's not what he meant. The reason that if anybody prayed all the time, they'd literally be quite useless. You know, I mean, especially when you have to be on your knees and close your eyes driving your car by Braille. Don't do that. Talking about driving your car with your eyes closed. Don't do that, by the way. My kids used to, uh, we used to drive, uh, when we lived in B.C., we'd drive up the Squamish Highway up to Whistler, and it's a winding highway, cliffs on one side, and a big ocean on the other, big drop in the other. They'd say, Dad, I'm so scared as you go around these corners. And I would tell them, do what I do, close my eyes. <laughs> Kidding, I didn't do that. <laughs> they would freak out at that age. Now they don't believe me almost for anything, I don't think. But, but I mean, 
but we, we think that this, the prayer means that we can't function in life then because we've got to be like monks, you know, cloistered away. And, and we're so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But I think that's only because we misunderstand really what Paul's talking about here. And we don't understand the meaning and the intent. Paul doesn't mean that we should be constantly spending our lives in a prayer meeting. That's not what he's talking about here. He isn't saying we should always be on our knees and have our eyes closed. I mean, certainly that's one kind of prayer, but that's not what he's talking about. The emphasis here is meaning that he's encouraging us to be in a constant communication with God. Now, I'm going to use the example of marriage. Some of you aren't married, I know, but, but I've been married now for 29 years, and so I understand a little bit about communication. Debbie's taught me. <laughs> um, but, but in marriage, we're not simply talking about those times when we sit down regarding communication and, and have formal conversations with our spouse. I mean, that's, if that's the only time we have communication, then, then that would be a little awkward, and, and it just wouldn't work fully well. Communication in marriage takes place constantly, right? It's, uh, we communicate through our words, through our actions, through our silence even. And uh, I mean, have you noticed any uh, c certain couples who've been married for a long time and, and often they'll even finish each other's sentences? That's just weird, but uh, it works and, and you see that often. Or there's this mystery of nonverbal communication. That happens often as well. I mean, you married couples know what I mean. I mean, that look right, where she raises her eyebrow, you're in the room, you're at a, somebody's house, maybe you're at a party, and there's this, this nonverbal communication. It means so many different things between couples. And, 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 you know, she'll say something, you're at this party, and she'll go with that one look, and you know what she means. Hey, honey, bunny, it's time that we got to go home, got to pick up the milk on the way. Oh, with one little eyebrow flick. How does she get that in there? But somehow the guy knows. And, and so he goes and gets the coats without a word being said, and they go on their way with a side trip to Sobeys, right? And uh, they're on their way home. No one else in the room gets it. No one. But couples not only get it, they speak it fluently. I mean, it is an amazing mystery, I have to admit, <laughs> got to tell you. Now, why does that happen between couples? Here's my point. Why does that happen? It's because they have shared their lives with each other to such a degree that they begin to think alike. Now, here's a question I have for us when it relates to the communication with us and God. Wouldn't it be great to have that kind of relationship with God? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have such a continuing conversation with Jesus that you regularly already knew what God wanted you to know without even having to ask? Oh, that would be great. Listen, we all breathe without ceasing. We get that. We understand that. We do it to live. If you stop breathing, what would happen? You die, right? There's no argument there. It's pretty cut and dry. That's the same thing with prayer, though. We can call it spiritual breathing if it helps you kind of think of it this way. When we breathe physically, what, we're, what we are doing is we're flushing out this poisonous carbon dioxide that shouldn't be in our bodies, and, and we inhale life-giving oxygen. That's what we do. Spiritual breathing means that we expel the poisonous sin in our lives through confession and repentance to God, and we're inhaling and inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us with His power. So as I go about my day, I'm learning to be in constant communication with my Heavenly Father. I'm learning this in, in something I'm growing in. I'm repenting and receiving. I'm listening and praising, whether it's in a formal setting with my eyes closed or informally, as I'm driving my car, taking Bryce to school, and, and I say even a, a sentence prayer, hey, God, thanks for the day. There's this communication thing going on. Sometimes I just passively sit and I'm listening for Him. Sometimes it doesn't mean always verbal conversation. Sometimes it's nonverbal. Sometimes it's verbal. Sometimes it's sitting and waiting. Sometimes it's uh, interactive. Sometimes I'm mad. Sometimes he is. <laughs> but like a father, though, with love. Learn to communicate throughout your day with a God who listens and cares. It's not only good for your soul, church, it's, uh, but it's vital for your spiritual existence, just as air is to your physical life. Remember it that way. Finally, Paul tells us next to give thanks in all circumstances. So once again, I think we need to qualify this statement. He, Paul isn't saying that we're to give thanks for all circumstances, by the way, and I think it's misunderstood that way. He's not saying for everything that happens in your life. I mean, obviously, you can't be thankful for injustice. You can't. For, for tragedies, for diseases, for war. I, I, we can't be thankful for that kind of stuff. None of these things are good. However, we are to give thanks in all things. There's the difference. 
Back to our main text. I want to take a look at that again. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What Paul is saying is that thankfulness really needs just to be a way of life for us, naturally flowing from our hearts and from our mouths. Second nature. The question is, are we experiencing life like this? Well, we can. The message of the gospel, when properly understood, creates a spirit of thankfulness in all, in all circumstances. Paul wrote to the Roman Christians, in fact, and he said this in Romans 8, 28, and we know that those, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, meaning God's purpose. What's he telling us there? He's saying God is working in all things, not just isolated instances, but he's working in all things for our good. That doesn't mean that all things happen to us are good. I mean, evil is still rampant in this world. It's still an ongoing uh, um, um, issue that is going to be defeated at the end one day. God promises us that, but for now, we're in a place where evil does happen in this fallen world. But God is able to turn all things to good in the long range to those of his who love him. Now, it's important to note, by the way, that Paul isn't saying that God's will is to make us happy. <laughs> That's not what he's saying here. Paul isn't saying believe in yourself and you can be all that God has created you to be. You can be a better you. That's not what he's saying here. Paul's saying, listen, life can be messy. Life can bring challenges. Life will bring challenges, in fact. But he's saying that if you love God, you'll trust in him. You won't trust in life's treasures. That you're going to look to heaven for your security, not to the things on the earth. And that you're going to learn to accept and not resent the pain and the persecution because you know that you can trust in God's ultimate goodness. You know that ultimately it leads to good. So we need to live lives of thanksgiving to God, not because we hope that he's going to perform a miracle to bring us out of some of our circumstances. And yeah, he might. But he might not too. Or that he's going to give us something to make us feel better about ourselves. He might, but he might not too. But we give thanksgiving to God because, and here's why, because he's due thanksgiving. He's due all praise, all glory, and all worship. And we need to be thankful simply because God is worthy and because God is good. When we're thankful, our focus then moves off our selfish desires and off the pain of current circumstances. See, I'm not, I'm thankful. I have to be thankful to somebody or to someone or something else. And so I'm taking the focus off of me. It's not about me. It's about him. And so I'm thanking him for all the good things he brings in my life. Expressing helpfulness or thankfulness helps us to remember that God's in control. Thankfulness then, church, is not only appropriate, it's actually healthy and is beneficial to us as disciples of Jesus Christ. It reminds us of the bigger picture that we belong to God and that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And if we get this, church, if we get this, if we truly understand the implications of these truths, then we're going to be grateful in every circumstance. If we focus on the up and down circumstances of life, we're going to be seasick grumblers. But if we focus on the Lord, we're going to be thankers. No one promised that life would be easy. In fact, Jesus even said and told, himself, or told them, he said, listen, in the world you will have trouble. He's honest about this stuff. You're going to have some trouble. However, I love what he adds, and Jesus adds right after that. He says, but listen, I've overcome the world. Amen? Yep, absolutely. So, let's wrap this up. Let's bring this to a conclusion so we can all get out to our turkey dinners and give thanks around the table with our family and friends and then get back to that football game that we're all waiting for. I know. So, as you sit in front of that nice roaring television set, some of you will get that. Anyways, okay. <laughs> now, what I shared with you may sound all great and good. It sounds, okay, that's good stuff, Pastor Steve. But the question remains, how to do it? How in the world do I get this and make this happen? I'll admit, I've got to tell you right now, I'll be honest with you, that I struggle with this kind of stuff, with these commands. I mean, too often I find myself swallowed up in complaints rather than gratitude, sour mood, rather than an attitude of deep-seated joy. 
Sometimes I have to remind myself to talk with God. However, what Paul commands of us, what God desires for, uh, from us is not unreasonable and is certainly not impossible. We've got to stop looking at these verses as if they were grand exaggerations. Listen, church, we can be joyful always. We can pray without ceasing. And we can always be thankful. But it all comes back to and depends upon our relationship with God. So I think it's time for us to get serious and ask ourselves some questions and be honest with ourselves. Listen, if, if, if I lack joy, it's because I've lost sight of God. If I become lax in my prayer life, it's because I'm thinking too highly of myself. If we find thankfulness elusive, it's because we've put our focus in the wrong place, church. We've got to remember that doing the will of God starts by being the person God has called us to be. If you want to do His will, the place to start is to develop an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The thing about these commands is if you really start working on one, here's what I find amazing, the others fall into place. It doesn't matter where you start, in fact. Each one falls into place and they tend to follow. If you find your joy in the Lord in all circumstances, we'll want to talk with Him. And we will be grateful and we will be thankful. If we adopt an attitude of thanksgiving, we're going to find ourselves giving thanks at all times and our attitude and outlook will be one of joy. If we learn to pray without ceasing, we're going to find the joy of our relationship with God is going to overshadow the trials of our lives and it's going to lead us to a constant sense of thankfulness. You see how that works? Start one place. It doesn't matter. Just begin. So start somewhere. Now included in the, in the notes on the back side of your bulletin, what I've done is I've given you four practical suggestions. If, now some of you may be okay and maybe you've already doing a bunch of these things, but it, it, these are just some helps for you and some suggestions that might help you to get a start. Why don't you just put some little sticky notes around the house or in your car that ask, have I talked to God lately? I mean, think about this. We often tell our kids that they've got to check in with us regularly. Well, God, he's our Heavenly Father. He wants us to be checking in with him too. So remind yourselves about that. Memorize this text that I just uh, used this morning as our main text in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. And memorize it. And it's not that hard. And in fact, you can tell people, listen, I just memorized three verses. That's a pretty short three verses there. But there, I want to encourage you now. When you feel yourself getting anxious or uptight about the events of life, learn to say to self, look to Jesus. Quit looking at the ups and downs around me and the circumstances. I'm going to focus across the water. I'm going to look over at, the, at that city and I'm going to see Jesus there. That's where I'm going to focus. And when you face something in your life that threatens to overwhelm you, ask yourself, okay, do I trust him or don't I? These four suggestions, I think, would be a benefit to you and very helpful. But ultimately, ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to do this. Because humanly, we can't. Because it goes against our natural instinct. So invite him to lead you and to guide you. Listen, church, these commands are not unrealistic. In fact, I know that each one of us can do these things if we submit our lives to Jesus and we invite the Holy Spirit to come in and work in us and change our hearts and minds. And if we work on these areas of our lives, we're going to find that Jesus will become absolutely more precious. The trials of life will be less devastating. And I've got to tell you, we will be a lot more fun to be around. Amen, church? Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and uh, as they're coming up, I'll share a video.